Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the recordings we did and some of the people that I had the wonderful opportunity to talk with and meet and how it all came about. It's interesting. I've always been fascinated with music and, and opera and popular song and barbershop harmony and jazz and whatever it may be. I like all different types of stuff. And so I always was involved musically and singing and, and performing. And I got involved in a wonderful vocal group. It was called Wind Place and Show. And we had a very interesting story. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of it because this is some fascinating parts, which I'll save for another story because there's just so many stories about that group that I have to share. But the thing is that Wind Place and Show, after we finally counted it toward the end of our running, we did about 630 performances. It's a lot over the course of about eight years. And um, we performed at all of the racetracks. We worked for the New Jersey Racing Authority. We were involved in New York. We did hotels. We did the Summit Hotel. We did lots of private parties. We sang on river boats. We, we worked here, there, and everywhere. It was a fascinating and remarkable journey. The original group was founded in 1981, and uh, it was myself. Although, one person did sing one uh, performance before this time without me. His name was Don McDermott. And uh, after that, it was John Murray singing tenor, Don Dennis singing the lead. I was singing baritone. And Bill, Bill Farazano was singing bass. And we called ourselves Wind Blaze and Show. We walked, worked at all the racetracks. And we were singing in Mammoth, we were singing in uh, some of the uh, other racetracks in the South New Jersey, and we were singing at the Meadowlands mainly. As I said, we also did stuff in New York as well. And we would be hired out to do stuff for various government and public officials, and um, uh, Governor Brendan Byrne was very fond of us, and spent many times chit-chatting with him, and he would always kind of be happy to see us. And I'll talk about him another time, too. Interesting stories about him. Tom Kane and that gang, all of those people would be there occasionally. And um, lots of great personalities we would meet. We would meet, you know, like Rocky Graziano, the boxer. And he would come in with his entourage. And after you'd sing, he'd have to shake your hand and you'd moan in pain to show how strong he was. He was an old guy at that point. But he was great. He was fun. And if you've grown well enough, you got a great tip. <laughs> and uh, Frank Sinatra was there one time. I remember Anthony Newley, Michael J. Fox. It was lots of great actors and actresses and wannabes and those that didn't make it and cab calloway was there and lots of others i'm hardly mentioning half of them and robert merrill would always be coming to the meadowlands with his buddy yogi berra and he and yogi uh well, I know Robert Merrill smokes cigars. I don't know if if uh, Yogi Berra smokes cigars or not, but uh, Robert Merrill would always have a big stogie. And uh, they would go and get a table right by the window to watch the horse race at the Meadowlands, which was a place called Pegasus. That was the fancy restaurant on top. And they'd bring a small television so they could watch the ball game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> While, uh, while uh, 
the races were going on. They had other folks there, uh, uh, lots of uh, government officials, lots of, you know, George Steinbrenner was there a lot. Joe DiMaggio was there every now and then. Um, and I'm trying to think of some of the people. I'll probably think of it when I finish. But it was a wonderful gathering of fascinating people. And uh, Robert Merrill used to have us come over, and he used to try to sing with us sometimes. It was kind of fun. And... Uh, well, that group went on for a long, long time. And as I said, we did 630 performances. We had a lot of people filling in. Just names that from long past. Warren Boyne, John Russo, Carl Stosh, Jack Murphy, um, Jack Kelly, excuse me. Not, um, and a few other folks filled in, of course. Uh, uh, we had uh, others that would come in here, there, and everywhere else. It was kind of fun. And uh, that lasted for a long time, and my memories of Robert Merrill kind of stuck from those days. And later on, as I have mentioned in a previous video going back a while ago, I became good friends with Jerome Hines. And he introduced me to his friends, and I got to learn a lot about singing and 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 great singers, and Franco Corelli would come by all the time, and I used to go and pick them up in the car and meet them at their place on, was it 57th Street, I think, and uh, take them over to Jerry's house, and we would all sit down and have dinner and sing around the table and tell stories and wonderful stuff. I think Robert Merrill came one time. Once again, we got to all talk. Of course, Jerry Hines' wife had Lou Gehrig's disease. She was in a room on a ventilator. And uh, Jerry was my biggest and greatest supporter in all of my work. He was such a nice man. He was really good to me. And he had that voice, you know. <laughs> and he used to call up and say, guess who? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't know. Um, but he introduced me to a lot of people. And one day he said, you want to make recordings of people. You want some opera singers? I said, yeah, well, classical musicians, perhaps of the past, uh, who are still around. It'd be great to capture them on wax. And he went through his files and he was going through them. And he's dead. You know, and <laughs> going through. And he, he pulled out a couple. And I was just looking here, trying to remember some of them. And he pulled out Isaac Stern. Uh, Anna Maffo, Cheryl Mills, Robert Merrill, Marilyn Horn, and uh, Licia Albanese. And, uh, and so he sat there and said, All right, I'm going to hold your hand. He <laughs> would always say that because I would always ask for his help and he'd say, I'll give you a hand. And, uh, he did that. He went to recording sessions we did with Tony Randall. Uh, we made a whole bunch of recordings with Tony Randall, and he came to some of the other things that we did. And he was very, very helpful, very kind to me. And so he said, let me make some phone calls while you're here. I said, okay. And so the first person he called was Isaac Stern. And I knew of Isaac Stern. And uh, I remember the conversation. The phone rang and he said, Hello, Isaac. It's Jerry Hines. And I heard from the, I could hear from the receiver, Jerry, how the hell are you? <laughs> from Isaac Stern. And uh, he sat there and explained the situation and, and said, Would you like to talk to Jack? And he said, Yes. And I had a nice little conversation with Isaac Stern. And we set up a uh, a possible date to make some recordings, which we would eventually in the future. And then he talked to Robert Merrill. And I sat and chit-chatted with Robert Merrill and talked about 
those days in the Meadowlands and stuff like that. You kind of get a laugh out of that. Cheryl Mills we talked to. Anna Maffo. Um, Lee Taylor Bernays, which who we, I never spoke to again. It was, I saw her a couple of times and talked to her and shook her hand, stuff like that, but she didn't seem to be very interested. And Marilyn Horn, we talked to her for a while. Now, of all of these, the interesting thing is the three that kind of stood out and seemed to be interested in it were Isaac Stern, Robert Merle, and Anna Maffo. And so I started calling them on my own, and we worked out a recording date for Isaac Stern, and we worked out a recording date for Robert Merrill. Now, Anna Maffa was different. She loved to talk, and I would call her at her home, and we would talk for 45, 50 minutes, and she would talk about everything. She'd talk about her housekeeper. She talked about dinner. She talked about singing. She talked about artists. She talked about making her revival. She talked about all kinds of stuff. It was fascinating. And uh, of this whole gaggle, we would make two recordings. In Amafo, um, she had some issues. She wasn't. I think she was not too well toward the end. and uh, But we sure had some great conversations. I will tell you that. She liked to talk about stuff. And Isaac Stern I recorded. And Robert Merrill I recorded. And I wanted to talk about Robert Merrill. He lived in New Rochelle, New York. And we set everything up to make the recording. And uh, got up there. And it was... It was a um, nice day and brought the equipment in. I had a cameraman with me and a lot of wax blanks because I wasn't quite sure what we were going to do. He might feel like singing. I, you know, I just didn't know. And so we, we sat there and toyed around and played. I brought a, a, a portable uh, Victrol or gramophone with me with a certain recording that he talked about listening to when he was a kid. And uh, so we set things up and we ended up just talking for about two hours. We sat there and chatted about the old Met and he talked about his dressmaker and he said they were complaining about cigarettes and now they're smoking pot back there. You know, <laughs> and he talked about uh, UCB Erling and how it was very hard to walk down the street with him if there was a bar down the side of the street because he, come on, Bob, let's just go have one. And he said, I knew one meant 20. He also talked about that spectacular recording of Pearl Fishers, which I was fascinated by. By the way, uh, Robert Merrill's son, I was a recording engineer, and it was neat. We could talk about early recording and modern recording. And he was there. And uh, what was really fascinating, I said, when you made that recording of Pearl Fisher's with UC, how did you set it up? And he said, well, UC was always closer to the microphone. And he said, I was back some. And he said, then we blended well. He said, because he said my voice was too big, too close. And the way it worked best, he said, if we were at a 45 degree angle, you see was there and then I was back. And that's how that recording was made. They weren't both right there at the microphone because you see needed to be closer. And he insisted on being closer, but that's another story altogether. Um, and then we finally made recordings, and he talked about his childhood and bo being born and screaming, and his mother said he was singing right away. And he said he played stickball and baseball, and he discovered singing, and he said a rich uncle gave us a phonograph with some Caruso records, and he said he just used to love to listen to them. And he said they would sit there and have a ball game, and he'd say he was sick. He said, I wasn't sick. I was listening to Caruso. And so 
after we made the recordings and, you know, so far, you know, he started singing a little bit and doing this stuff, which is kind of cool, and capturing it on wax. I pulled out a recording of Caruso doing Vesta La Juve, and I put it on, his eyes closed, and he started to cry. I didn't film that, of course. I didn't want to do anything like that. This was a personal moment to share with him, listening to a recording, and I was looking at little Robert Merrill. And uh, afterwards, he finished, and he said, that was really beautiful, thank you. And then he gave me a little tour around his house, and he was showing me he had a whole collection of Caruso caricatures on his wall. And he said, you know, I've made lots of records. And he said, you know what sold the most? And I said, no. He said, the Wolfenpoof song. <laughs> of everything I recorded, that was the thing that recorded sold the most. I thought that was kind of cool. I spent a wonderful day with him. Had a grand time. And we parted as much closer friends. And uh, it was truly a delight. I mean, there were so many things he talked about, his colleagues and singing. And he talked about the old Met and the new Met and the Yankees, of course. And uh, remembering Richard Tucker, who he sang a lot with. And, of course, uh, Jan Pierce. And, of course, Jerry Hines and Franco Corelli and and all the others, and Anna Muffo, and uh, you name it, they were in his conversations. That was pretty fascinating stuff. I know, maybe, I don't, I hope you don't mind me just rambling on here about this stuff, but I think it's fun stuff to share. Um... There's so many things, because I interviewed and recorded about 30, 35 individuals from the 20th century who made a great impression upon it. And it was a great honor and a wonderful privilege to be in the company of some of the most incredible people. And not only incredible by what they did, but because of what their personality was like. And their friendly, kind, and warm nature. And so, going from the days of singing for some of these folks and then recording them years later, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite uh, an incredible journey and remarkable memories and I have some neat photographs. Someday I'm going to put a lot of this stuff together and create something. i got to find someone that writes well. I can't write to save my life. And then try to record some of this stuff because it should be preserved. I know talking about it's good because otherwise if I don't talk about it, it'll be completely lost. But uh, uh, those were fascinating and interesting days and you know a lot of those singers talked about the old met and said that stage was was man-eating and woman-eating whatever because you couldn't hear yourself well on the stage but everybody could hear perfectly in the audience and of course maria callas who was talked about by everyone jerry hines used to say that he thought some of her troubles vocally the strain came from that stage of the old Met because she couldn't hear herself. I don't know how strong that is, that theory, but it's probably as good as any other. And he was there. He should know. Well, I think I've rambled on enough here on bouncing all over the place. But remembering recording Robert Merrill and great conversations with Anna Mafo, and later recording 
Isaac Stern. Lots of great, great people. Fascinating people who entertained the world for a short while were wonderful and interesting conversation companions with me. And I was a very lucky person. And I thank you.